Hey, and welcome to this tutorial on the Mullins effect. Um, the Mullins effect is an important uh, type of behavior that occurs in elastomers and rubber under cyclic loading. It's a damage phenomenon that there is some confusion about. Some people confuse the Mullins effect and the pain effect, and they're very different things. So uh, uh, that's something that uh, I will talk more about in this uh, little um, discussion today. And I will also talk about the pain effect in, in another video in the future. Um, so what is, the, what is the Mullins effect? Um, let's take a look. The Mullins effect occurs in rubbers and rubber-like materials. And most elastomers undergo this type of softening. So this is a softening that occurs during the first few load cycles. Um, and if you have a material or a product that, that undergoes thousands of cycles, this may not be so important for you, because this is a softening that happens in the first three to five cycles in the material. And after that, the response becomes fully repeatable, and uh, it's easier to analyze it at that point uh, because of that. Um, the amount of softening that occurs, this Mullins softening or Mullins damage, is uh, related strongly to the amount of filler particles that is in the rubber. The more filler particles there are, the more damage you see, the stronger is the Mullins effect. There are some materials that have very little Mullins effect. These are typically unfilled uh, natural rubber or uh, silicon rubber that's unfilled. But most rubbers that are used in industrial applications have some amount of Mullins damage or Mullins softening during the first few load cycles. Um, the, what's interesting about this is, is how it manifests itself in the stress strain response. And I will show you a lot of figures about that in our discussion today. It's dependent predominantly on the max strain or the max energy that the material has been exposed to. But note though that the Mullins effect is not permanent. This damage is not a permanent damage that actually recovers over time. If you give the material a chance to recover, the Mullins damage will go away. And uh, this recovery uh, is relatively slow for some materials, but it often can be made faster in an elevated temperature environment. So that's something else to, to think about. Um, I will talk about different material models that can be used to predict the Mullins damage, the Mullins softening. None of those models uh, have built in recovery in them. So if you're interested in predicting recovery, you may have to implement it yourself uh, or to do some more work in that area. The commercial finite element codes don't do that today. Um, so here's the first figure that shows a very brief representation of what the Mullins damage is. So I took a material piece of rubber here and I compressed it to about 70% strain and the red curve is the response I get. Then I took the material out of the test machine and put it back in again and run another test on the same specimen and then I get the blue curve. And then I did it a third time and a fourth time. You see that each of these times the stress magnitude kept going down a little bit but it seems to approach a steady state response. And that's this softening that occurs during the first few load cycles is the Mullins damage. So clearly this can be important if you want to analyze your products very accurately. So, so that's the purpose of our discussion here today. Um, I have a little video here that shows uh, what happens if you do a little more sophisticated experiment. So this is a cyclic test. I took a compression specimen, a little cylinder, and I compressed it, unloaded it, compressed it a little bit more, unloaded it, and I did four cycles on this material. And in this, um, you can see the stress strain response during this type of test. So here it is, I'm compressing it, and um, you see the stress strain becomes more and more negative. I'm gonna continue playing it here, it unloads. So this is an important point, right? So if this is, this is a chloroprene rubber, but it could have been any rubber, as soon as we start unloading, we follow a different path. And this difference in unloading from compared to the loading could be either due to this Mullins damage, the material has been damaged, or it could be due to viscoelastic effects. So we'll need to talk about that in terms of how do we distinguish these two things? How do we know if it's Mullins damage versus if it's a viscoelastic relaxation phenomenon? And that can be a little tricky, right? So, so we continue our test here, we go back to zero, and then we load it again. And you see that it follows that path and it goes back in another cycle. I'm gonna to try to stop here. See in third cycle here, we come at this point, we are at a slightly lower stress than we had during the second cycle. So this difference here 
is the amount of Mullen's damage or Mullen's softening that occurs in this material as we keep loading it. But you will see though, as this continues to compress, it kind of approaches the same stress level at the turnaround point. And that shows that the damage has some very interesting behaviors to it. So unloading here, then we're loading it again. Here we go. So see, it's pretty significantly softer here. We almost hit this point again. So if we had done a continuous homogeneous compression test, the response we would have seen would have followed the lower envelope of these curves here. The rest is viscoelastic responses and Mullins damage that are go together in this behavior. So let's finish the test here. It goes there and then goes unloading all the way back. So that's how Mullins damage looks when you do a real experiment. And this is an excellent experiment because it has both the loading, the unloading, and reloading uh, in the same experiment. It gives you a lot of information. In fact, it has enough information to, to distinguish how much is the viscoelastic response and how much is the Mullins damage behavior. Um, so let's talk about now the different methods that you can use to predict the Mullins damage. The most common way is the ogden roxbury model. Here you can see the equation that's used in this. This, this model for the Mullins damage, Mullins uh, softening, is built into almost all commercial finite element codes, and it's pretty well known. The way it works is that it has a scalar damage equation, as you can see here. Eta is a scalar damage parameter that's multiplied with the deviatoric part of the strain energy density. So the volumetric part is assumed to not change due to damage, but the deviatoric is. And here's the equation that gives that. So uh, if you don't remember, the ERF is the R function. Uh, and this has the shape that's shown here that I copied from uh, math, uh, Wolfram's math word. And you can see that from zero up to one, both in tension and compression here in this, this kind of graph. What's interesting, if, if we try to interpret this equation, all right, if we are monotonically loading, that means that the strain energy density psi is equal to the current value of the strain energy density is equal to the maximum the material has seen. So this is a state variable, variable that contains the maximum strain energy density that the material has seen. This is the current value. If they're the same, so then the denominator the becomes zero. The R function of zero is zero. So this becomes, damage becomes one. That means there is no damage. So under monotonic loading, this is not active. It only becomes active when you are at the position where the energy is lower than the maximum it has seen. So during unloading or reloading until it reaches this state again. The next thing we can see is that the worst damage you can have is if the, 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 the deviatoric uh, current strain energy is zero and you have some other uh, energy that's seen before. So this minus this then becomes a positive value. And the maximum, so we're on the x-axis over here somewhere, the maximum value of this error function would be one. So then eta would be one minus one over r, and this system can never be larger than one. It's always between zero and one. So you see there's one minus one over r. So if r is really large, say r is equal to 100, then eta will be between uh, 0 0.99 and 1. So very little damage. R, R should be typically larger than 1, obviously. Otherwise, you can have negative damage. Uh, and R in most materials where you have damage is 2 or 3 or 4 or 5, something like that. Uh, if R is more than 10, there's really no need to activate this feature anyway. Um, so that's how you can think of the, the parameters in this uh, uh, ogden roxbury damage model. The parameters needs to be found through calibration. The numbers we need to find is the R, which is the key value. It's dimensionless. It has uh, between, as I mentioned, the value between 1 and, and 10 or something like that. M is an energy parameter. It has the dimensions of energy. It has to do with the energy that the material has seen. And beta is a dimensionless parameter that really is usually very small and doesn't have that much influence on the predictions. So let's try this out here. Uh, I have some examples that I want to demonstrate. Um, let's try, let's try, here's an example. Let's try this one here. So I'm going to start by removing my calculated prediction. I'm just going to look at experimental data. 
So in this case, we have experimental data for a rubber that's uniaxial compression followed by unloading. The unloading response is different than the loading, and you may say, well, how do we know if this unloading is due to damage or something else? Well, let's try it out. Let's see if we can calibrate a, a hyperelastic model with Mullins damage and see if they can match this data. And I already did that. So here's my solution using M calibration, a polyumod. Uh, calibrated a yo hyperelastic model with Mullins damage. I select this one, I say run, and here's the prediction. So these are the Mullins parameter, I'm sorry, the, the yo hyperelastic parameters, and here's the, the R value of 3, U hat value of 0.18. And it matches the data actually pretty well. Um, how about if we assume that this material has no damage, but all of this response we see in this experiment it's purely viscoelasticity. Would that work? Well, let's try that too, out too. So I had calibrated a Bergstrom Boyce model, which I talked about in one of my other videos. So I'm gonna just run my saved solution here. And you see now this is a Yo hyperelastic model uh, with two networks. One is just a hyperelastic, one is a hyperelastic with a flow element. This is a power flow element in this particular case, implemented in the polyumod TNV model. But it's a Bergstrom Boyce model. We see that the, a nonlinear visco um, elastic material model can match the data equally well as a hyperelastic with Mullins damage. So that is another way to practically show that in this case you can't distinguish if this data set, the red line here, is does it contain Mullins damage or not? You don't know. Is it is it purely damage or no viscoelasticity? You don't know. We don't have enough information to distinguish those. And that's a, a clearly a problem in a case like this. You need more data, you need better data. You need to think about it a little bit more. So what, do we, what would you do if you really want to determine some of those effects? So let's look at this data set again. This is the data that I plotted earlier here. We loaded it, unloaded it, and reloaded it. So I can plot stress versus time. You can see that the stress goes up like this. If I plot on the y-axis, you know, strain versus time. See the strain goes up and then we hold and do this. Um, can we calibrate a, a, a Mullins damage model to this? Absolutely not. We know that by just looking at the data, a hyperelastic with Mullins damage can't predict this because we have, as, as we load, unload, and reload, we follow different paths. There is a first time loading, there's an unloading path that's different than the reloading path. That clearly shows us that it's not possible to, to uh, uh, describe or prescribe this response due to Mullins effect only. Clearly, there is some viscoelasticity here. Could it be viscoelasticity by itself? No, it can't be that either, because if it was purely viscoelasticity, then the reloading curve would match the first reloading curve, and it's lower. So this indicates from this type of test, when we load it with larger and larger amplitudes, we can show very directly that this uh, data set has both viscoelasticity and Mullins damage. And we can calibrate the material model using that all at once. So I used uh, the Polyumod 3 network model, a TNV model here, and I used a, two networks in parallel. I used a Yo hyperelastic model, which uh, in, is next to a, a flow element, a power flow element. And next to that, the equilibrium network just has a Yo hyperelastic model with Mullins damage. That's the configuration that I selected. And I already uh, started this calibration. So if we see if we can plot the results, here are the results. And we'll see that the blue curve, which are the predictions here, match the data reasonably well. It's not super great. Um, I think that maybe we should run the calibration a little bit longer, and I think we'll uh, improve it. Um, but we can clearly see that the, the combination of nonlinear viscoelasticity with the Mullins damage captured most of these effects that we see here. So that's what I would do in a case like this, where you're trying to calibrate a, a damage model. And I would always assume that material also is viscoelastic, linear or nonlinear viscoelastic, but there has to be some viscoelasticity. And I would need to do experiments of this kind in, uh, or, or you can do something similar, we use cycles with the same strain amplitude, a number of them, and then you switch to another strain amplitude, something like that, in order to distinguish. 
how much is damage versus the viscoelastic response. And that's kind of the, the approach that I, that I would use in a case like this. Um, my final uh, little uh, hint here is sometimes it is possible to look at the data set to see, uh, even if it's just in one cycle, to see if the, the behavior contains Mullins damage or not. So, so my hint is, if you were to uh, simply plot the slope, look at the slope at initial loading here. So this uh, you see kind of the Young's modulus, you would call it, at compression. That has some value. And then you look at the Young's modulus over here. And if, you, if this modulus here is lower, so it's less stiff here than it is during the first unloading behavior, then that is an indication that the material contains the Mullins damage. Of course, a viscoelastic material model would have the same slope here as it would here. In this case, it looks like this is actually steeper here than it is here. Clearly, that would indicate that it's some Mullins damage and you would have to take care of that. Um, maybe I can take a quick look and see if we can plot on the y-axis the tangent stiffness. Maybe we can demonstrate that uh, more graphically. Tangent modulus, uh, let's do true tangent modulus here. And we can see, we go here. Initially, it's small. And then we unload. And then we have a higher value here than we have here. So that's an indication, yes, this, this was a case like I described where there is some uh, Mullins damage in the material. Even from a single cycle, we can establish that. But of course, we can't calibrate the material model accurately unless we do multiple uh, load cycles, as I talked about. Um, with that, um, I will end. Uh, the, the key here is Mullins damage is easy to calibrate once you have the experimental data. And calibration can do this for you very quickly. Um, once uh, you have that, you can put it into your finite element simulation. You can get excellent predictions of the Mullins damage if you need it. And uh, the cool thing about Mullins damage, once you have it in a finite element simulation, it doesn't slow you down at all. It's a very quick calculation for Abacus Ansys, LS Dyna, whatever you're using to perform the damage calculation. So it's a quick thing to do. Um, if you are interested in this, I would certainly recommend that you try to characterize it experimentally. I would never assume that there is no Mullins damage. I would include it in my testing. And if I need to, I would just ignore it in the end. But I will certainly include it in my testing so I can use it if I choose to in the later time. So plan ahead when you do the testing and give it a try. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, head over to polymerfm.com and you can ask your questions right there. Thank you.